Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Morrison, for this uh, extravagant but appreciated introduction to this most impressive audience in this ever so impressive place. This is my second time around in this beautiful auditorium. And I um, marvel the passage of time and the quick stride of the vessel rapidly and uh, from one year into another. And uh, crowds upon our heels with uh, an urgency that I hope to keep under restraint here as I talk to you this evening. I have uh, been exposed to radio and television and newspapers and all that goes with them here in this hospitable city of Salt Lake. I'm sure that I haven't a secret thought left at this moment when I should uh, be uh, disclosing my purpose in being here. It's all in the papers, all on the air. But what I planned to talk to you tonight about was the uh, Constitution of the United States in the context of freedom and slavery. There is uh, no intention on my part to give you any learned discourse on the nuances of recent or ancient Supreme Court decisions because this is not the place or the time for that. I think that I could not do better than begin with uh, something that I have on the authority of my uh, distinguished friend and your learned good neighbor, Elder Ezra Taft Benson. He told me this. He said the Lord told the prophet Joseph Smith that the time would come when an attempt would be made to overthrow the Constitution of the United States. That at that time, the destiny of this nation would hang by a single thread, but that this people, meaning the people of this church, would step forward and save it, end quote. Now I want to tell you as a result of my own observation that uh, this prophetic time is arrived. And if the prophesied salvation of the Constitution as Joseph Smith saw it, is to take place, then a great many people in this audience had better get busy, but fast. This is the substance. There isn't uh, any question about tomorrow are the imminence of all of these dire prophetic times and occurrences. The time is now, and the job is one that must be done presently and at once. So the question that launches this discourse is simply this. Uh, where is the Constitution of the United States today? And what is the nature of the string upon which it hangs so precariously tonight? And what does the precarious condition of the Constitution of the United States have to do with slavery and freedom here and all over the world? Because I have given this particular text to the paper, and because some of it may be in print at the moment, I think that I should answer this first part of this address in uh, so many words. So let me read it to you. 
in the Constitution of the United States, which is the last will and testament of our founding fathers, all Americans inherited a great and an enduring legacy of liberty. That will and testament, which is the Constitution, is being sharply contested now, and the odds are better than even that it will be broken and that this great legacy of liberty will be permanently destroyed. Our founding fathers who left us this heritage knew exactly what liberty means. And they went to great pains in their testament, which is the Constitution, to spell out the meaning of liberty and to put it carefully in trust for future generations. They told us in the Constitution in substance that liberty means limited civil government where civil government is limited by supreme and universally binding constitutional law. And where that law can be enforced by the simple suit of a single citizen to protect himself and his property and his liberty against trespasses by his government, there and in that place, the citizen is free. On the contrary, where the power of government is unlimited and where it is illimitable, there everybody who lives under that government is a slave. Our constitutional system represents the first attempt, my friends, ever successfully made on earth to keep civil government limited by strictly binding constitutional law. For more than 150 years, the system worked. At the present time, it is all but a total wreck. We are no longer governed by supreme, ascertainable constitutional law. At the present time, we are all governed by the whim, fixations, and ambitions of mere men. Most of these men are in the executive branch of the federal government. But our more important governors are now on the United States Supreme Court. For more than 150 years, the Supreme Court construed the Constitution according to the ascertainable meaning of the men who framed it. I told you that this Constitution was a last will and testament. And this is precisely the way all wills and testaments and trusts and such instruments are and have been construed by our courts for hundreds of years. At the present time, the Supreme Court of the United States no longer construes the meaning of the Constitution as that meaning was written into it by its founding fathers. On the contrary, our present Supreme Court remakes the Constitution at will and announces the changes on Monday morning of each succeeding week that the court is in session. If this, the current decisions of the Supreme Court are correct, then all of the hundreds of decisions made by the Supreme Court prior to 1950 are wrong. The test of the validity of what the government does today is not what the Constitution provides, but what five of the nine Supreme Court judges of the Supreme Court will think about what has been done by the government when that act comes before them for their judgment. Thus, I am sorry to say, there are no operable restrictions upon the power of the federal government today except the unpredictable mix of sociological predictions and fixations that are entertained by the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States from time to time. This is not the legacy of government by constitutional law that was left to Americans by their forefathers. On the contrary, this is unpredictable government 
by peculiarly unqualified men who are completely beyond the reach of the electorate. Ironically, the founding fathers anticipated that something like this might happen. And they provided a remedy for it in the Constitution itself. Article 3 of the Constitution provides that Congress may deprive the Supreme Court of all or any part of its appellate jurisdiction. Every case appealed to the Supreme Court from a lower court goes there only by the permission of the Congress of the United States. Congress can and Congress should now withdraw this permission in view of the notorious incompetence of the present Supreme Court of the United States to construe the Constitution of the United States, Congress should take away from the Supreme Court all jurisdiction to hear appeals in cases where constitutional questions are involved. Let me add that Congress has done just this in particular instances in the past. And bills are pending now before Congress to do precisely what I have described. The passage of those bills only depends upon the interest and the energy of the people of the United States. And I recall what the prophecy of Joseph Smith implied. And when the Constitution dangles in the balance by a slender thread like this, somebody is going to come forward and save it. And I adjure you in God's name to step up now and be counted and start to work. Just remember, please, that it is your freedom and the freedom of your children that is tied up in trust for you in the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution is a trust indenture, along with a will. And it places in trust for you and for your posterity the greatest fortune of freedom ever put together on Earth. Nothing, nothing in past history can compare to it. And if we, the beneficiaries of this trust, sit idly by and see its capital asset destroyed because of our ignorance and ineptitude, then we will deserve the slavery that will be the inevitable result of such inattention. And remember, too, that in your fight to reestablish constitutional rule in this country, there is no substitute for victory. In the absence of such a substitute, there is only one alternative, and that alternative is slavery. Which brings me to the point of this discussion tonight. The situation of human slavery in the present world. Whether or not human slavery is now an academic question, or whether it is something that faces us up directly and threateningly, not just some faraway place, but us. And if that is true, uh, what are we going to uh, do about it? And what is our attitude? Now, just a word about the manner in which I propose to conduct this discussion. Uh, I have neither the time nor the inclination to mince my words and neither have you. I want to... Uh, I want to recall for this purpose uh, something that uh, Senator Goldwater said in the course of his acceptance speech to the 1964 Republican National Convention. I was there and I heard it. I regard these uh, words not merely as the high point of the Goldwater campaign, but as the high point in the current struggle to preserve our constitutional system. Uh, let me recall to your mind what those words were. 
because this sentence generated more rancor and more antagonism and more silly criticism than anything that was said during the whole campaign of 1964. When Senator Goldwater paused and said this, everybody listened, and uh, from that time on in, we heard about very little else. Listen. He said, moderation in the sacred cause of liberty is no virtue. And by the same token, he added, extremism in the cause of virtue is no vice. End quote. Wherever this quotation came from, I don't know. Uh, but it was definitely inspired. This, my friends, is the candid, absolute truth. In the sacred cause of liberty, moderation is certainly no virtue. On the contrary, extremism is a virtue. Emphasis is a virtue. Enthusiasm is a virtue. And unrestrained devotion is a must. That is the kind of procedure that I propose to invoke for you here this evening with your permission. Let me say something else. Slavery is a very important subject. We have had some experience with it in the United States. I used to be a teacher of history. And when I taught history many years ago as a means of getting through the Notre Dame Law School, uh, William Lloyd Garrison was not one of my favorite characters. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison was a single-barreled abolitionist. He was agitated, excited, and distraught by the presence of three million Negro slaves in certain states of this union. And he was resolved and determined to do something about them. And so he barricaded himself in his little office in Boston because there were people round about who wanted to kill him. In spite of the threats upon his life, Garrison began the publication of what was called The Liberator. And in 1831, he published the first edition. And on the masthead of the front page of the first edition of this Liberator, William Lloyd Garrison said this. He said, I am aware that many will object to the severity of my language. But is there not cause for severity? I will expect to be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice, he said. On this subject, I do not wish to think speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell that man to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravager. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her baby from the fire into which it has fallen. But do not tell me to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest, he said. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch. And I will be heard because, he said, the apathy of the people today is enough to make every statue leap from its pedestal and hasten the resurrection of the dead, end quote. That is why I propose to receive, proceed here this evening with a notorious lack of restraint. I expect to be immoderate. I hope to be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice and as specific in my examples of the oncoming deluge of slavery as I can possibly be because as a result of this prophetic utterance, I hope I am facing a people who are determined, God-fearing, and unafraid. And that is what it takes now.
Let me tell you something. Uh, this, this quotation from William Lord Garrison is classical. He was worked up and properly worked up. He was angry and his anger was righteous. Woodrow Wilson, many years after this, when the proclamation of emancipation had been issued, congratulated Garrison, who persisted in this immoderate, urgent plea for the emancipation of the slaves up until the time that the 13th Amendment was passed. Uh, he knew what it took in order to do this job against the current of opposition that ran all over the country. He persisted and he won. I ask you this. If, Ma if Garrison had seen not just a three million slaves uh, about which he was excited, and properly so, what would his excitation have been if he had seen one billion slaves projected and advanced by the most diabolical, persistent, and effective slave system ever seen on this earth? What would William Lloyd Garrison have said and how would he have said it if he stood where we stand tonight and saw the forces of a slavery advancing across the world a thousand miles a month? encompassing more and more people, even as we sit here this evening. How much more excited, how much more immoderate, how much more extremist would he have been? How much would he have added to the language that I've just quoted to you? That being so, what kind of an excuse can we find for our protracted silence in the face of this deluge of diabolical slavery. And when you remember, my friend, that every inch of territory acquired by this modern system of diabolical slavery has been acquired with the aid and with the assistance of your government of the United States. And when you recognize that, how much more angry would you be tonight than Garrison was in 1831? How much more immoderate, how much more unrestrained? I dare say that if we could see as he saw uh, the evil of this system, which in his day was receding, but which in our day is advancing, and frequently with the aid and with the assistance of officers of our government and the press, and the other information media of the United States government. Well, we have finally come to grips with this system of slavery in one segmented part of the world. Last Saturday noon, one week ago today, I saw my son off on a boat from the Oakland dock along with 3,000 other Americans, destination Vietnam. He was glad to go, and I was proud and happy to see him take his place with that group on their way to Vietnam to face up to the communist clash with American forces in that faraway part of the world. Time does not permit an analysis of why we are there. Tonight it is sufficient to say that we are there and uh, that the president is right in putting us there. But let me add this, the president is wrong in not permitting these boys to win this war and come home as they should. President Johnson has said that this is a real war, and we all believe him it is such. And 
The mothers who have wept over the returning bodies of their sons will agree with him. The president had said this is really war. But the president has yet to say that the people who parade around our universities and through the streets of the United States carrying the Viet Cong flag are traitors. That's what I want to hear him say. And I want these people arrested and put in jail for treason, for aiding and abetting the enemies of the United States. I am not afraid that some communist will shoot my son from the front. But I resent any activity in this country which will cause my son to be shot from behind when he can't see what's going on. The President of the United States has said this is war. But he has not yet said that it being war, we should mine the harbor of Haiphong to prevent our allies, along with our enemies, from supplying the South Vietnam troops with material which will be shot into the soldiers of the United States fighting under the direction of the president in South Vietnam. We are not at war. We haven't declared war. This would invite international competitions, I understand. Nevertheless, General Key has declared war against North Vietnam, and General Key has wanted to mine the harbor of Haiphong. He could do it. He would have done it, except for the fact that we have stopped it. I want to know why we have stopped General Key from mining the harbor of Haiphong. General, or rather, Admiral Radford, former chief of staff for the American Armed Forces, said the other day that the harbor should be mine. General McConnell, our chief of staff for air, said in Detroit a few months ago that we could win the war in Vietnam practically overnight, end quote, if we would be permitted to use our air arm to bomb Hanoi and Haiphong and the military installations that surround them. Virtually overnight, we have the power to do it. Why do we not have the will to do it, I ask you? And how can we look our boys in the face when we do less than our part to help them carry out what they have been asked to have the courage to do in the jungles of this faraway place? You worry about a confrontation with communist China if this should happen? Let me remind you, my friends, that we have been in a confrontation with communist China for 20 years. We have been in a confrontation with communism from Moscow for a longer period than that. The question is, how much longer are we going to be pushed back in this confrontation? When are we going to recognize that we are in Armageddon? This is a battle between God and the devil. The question is, who is going to win? And the longer we wait, the further we retreat, the more land we lose, the more lives that are sacrificed. While we have every legal and moral right to put forces in the field to fight this diabolical opposition of communism, I say we do not have either a moral or a legal right to allow these forces to be whittled away until some uncertain time when Ho Chi Minh decides to sit down at some conference table and swindle us in the same kind of an agreement that was made in Korea.